Let's talk about classification of merchandise. Classification and when ad valorem rates of duty are applicable, appraisement, are the two most important factors affecting dutiable status. Classification and valuation, whether or not they are pertinent because an ad valorem rate of duty applies, must be provided by commercial importers when any entry is filed. In addition, classifications under the statistical suffixes of the tariff schedules must also be furnished, even though this information is not pertinent to dutiable status. Accordingly, classification is initially the responsibility of the importer, customs broker, or other person preparing the entry papers. Section 637 of the Customs Modernization Act imposes the requirement that importers exercise reasonable care when classifying and appraising merchandise. Familiarity with the organization of the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States facilitates the classification process. The tariff schedule is divided into various sections and chapters dealing separately with merchandise in broad product categories. These categories cover animal products, vegetable products, products of various basic materials such as wood, textiles, plastics, rubber and steel, and other metal products in various stages of manufacture, for example. Other sections encompass chemicals, machinery and electrical equipment, and certain exceptions from duty and special statutory provisions. Sections 1 through 21, products are classifiable as follows. 1. Under items of description which name them, known as an EO nominee provision. 2. Under provisions of general description. 3. Under provisions which identify them by component material, or for under provisions which encompass merchandise in accordance with its actual or principal use. When two or more provisions seem to cover the same merchandise, the prevailing provision is determined in accordance with the legal notes and the general rules of interpretation for the tariff schedule. Also applicable are tariff classification principles, contained in administrative precedents, or in the case law of the U.S. Court of International Trade, or the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Let's talk about liquidation. Customs officers at the port of entry, or other officials, acting on behalf of other port directors, review selected classifications and valuations, as well as other required import information, for correctness, or, as a proper basis for appraisement, as well as for agreement of the submitted data with the merchandise actually imported. The entry summary and documentation may be accepted as submitted without any changes. In this situation, the entry is liquidated as entered. Liquidation is the point at which the Customs Service's ascertainment of the rate and amount of duty becomes final for most purposes. Liquidation is accomplished by posting a notice on a public bulletin board at the Custom House. However, an importer may receive an advance notice on Customs Form 4333A or courtesy notice stating when and in what amount duty will be liquidated. This form is not for the liquidation and protest rights do not accrue until the notice is posted. Time limits for protesting do not start until the date of posting and a protest cannot be filed before liquidation is posted. We will talk about protest momentarily. The Customs Service may determine that an entry cannot be liquidated as entered for one reason or another. For example, the tariff classification may not be correct or may not be acceptable because it is not consistent with established and uniform classification practice. If the change required by this determination results in a rate of duty more favorable to an importer, the entry is liquidated accordingly, and a refund is authorized for the applicable amount of the deposited estimated duties. On the other hand, a change may be necessary which imposes a higher rate of duty. For example, a claim for an exemption from duty under a free rate provision, or under a conditional exemption may be found to be insufficient for lack of the required supporting documentation. In this situation, the importer will be given an advance notice of the proposed duty rate increase and an opportunity to validate the claim for a free rate or more favorable rate of duty. If the importer does not respond to the notice, or if the response is found to be without merit, entry is liquidated in accordance with the entry as corrected and the importer is billed for the additional duty. The port may find that the importer's response raises issues of such complexity that resolution is warranted by a customs headquarters decision through internal advice procedure. Internal advice from customs headquarters may be requested by local customs officers on their own initiative 
or in response to a request by the importer. Now, let's talk about protests. After liquidation, an importer may still pursue, on Customs Form 19, any claims for an adjustment or refund by filling a protest within 90 days after liquidation. In order to apply for a headquarters ruling, a request for further review must be filed with the protest. The same Form 19 can be used for this purpose. If filed separately, application for further review must still be filed within 90 days of liquidation. However, if a ruling on the question has previously been issued, in response to a request for a decision on a prospective transaction or a request for internal advice, further review will ordinarily be denied. If a protest is denied, an importer has the right to litigate the matter by filing a summons with the U.S. Court of International Trade within 180 days after denial of the protest. The rules of the court and other applicable statutes and precedents determine the course of customs litigation. While the Customs Service's ascertainment of dutiable status is final for most purposes at the time of liquidation, a liquidation is not final until any protest which has been filed against it has been decided. Similarly, the administrative decision issued on a protest is not final until any litigation filed against it has become final. Entries must be liquidated within one year of the date of entry, unless the liquidation needs to be extended for another one-year period, but not to exceed a total of four years from the date of entry. The Customs Service will suspend liquidation of an entry when required by statute or court order. A suspension will remain in effect until the issue is resolved. Notifications of extensions and suspensions are given to importers, surety companies, and customs brokers, who are parties to the transactions. Let's talk about the conversion of currency and how that's relevant to the classification and valuation of imported goods. The conversion of foreign currency for customs purposes must be made in accordance with the provisions of Title 31, U.S.C., Section 5151. This section states that customs is to use rates of exchange determined and certified by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. These certified rates are based on the New York market buying rates for the foreign currencies involved. In the case of widely used currencies, rates of exchange are certified each day. The rates certified by the first business day of each calendar quarter are used throughout the quarter, except on days when fluctuations of 5% or more occur, in which case the actual certified rates for those days are used. For infrequently used currencies, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York certifies rates of exchanges upon request by customs. The rates certified are only the currencies and dates requested. For customs purposes, the date of exportation of the goods is the date used to determine the applicable certified rate of exchange. This remains true even though a different rate may have been used in payment of the goods. Information as to the applicable rate of exchange in converting currency, for customs purposes in the case of a given shipment, may be obtained from a port director of customs. The entry filer is responsible for using reasonable care to value imported merchandise and provide any other information necessary to enable the customs officer to properly assess the duty and determine whether any other applicable legal requirement is met. The customs officer is then responsible for fixing the value of the imported merchandise. The valuation provisions of the Tariff Act of 1930 are found in Section 402. Generally, the customs value of all merchandise exported to the United States will be the transaction value of the goods. If the transaction value cannot be used, then certain secondary bases are considered. If secondary bases of value, listed in order of precedence for use are 1. Transaction value of identical merchandise 2. Transaction value of similar merchandise 3. Deductive value 4. Computed value The order of precedence of the last two values can be reversed if the importer so requests in writing at the time of filing the entry. I'll talk about these secondary bases in later videos. Now, let's talk about transaction value. The transaction value of imported merchandise is the price actually paid or payable for the merchandise when sold for exportation to the United States, plus amounts for the following items if they are not included in the price. 1. The packing costs incurred by the buyer. 2. Any selling commission incurred by the buyer. 3. The value of any assist. 
for any royalty or license fee that the buyer is required to pay as a condition of the sale. 5. The proceeds, accruing to the seller, of any subsequent resale, disposal, or use of the imported merchandise. The amounts for the above items are added, only to the extent that each is not included in the price actually paid or payable, and information is available to establish the accuracy of the amount. If sufficient information is not available, then the transaction value cannot be determined, and the next basis of value, in order of precedence, must be considered for appraisement. Packing costs consist of the cost incurred by the buyer, for all containers and coverings of whatever nature, and for the labor and materials used in packing the imported merchandise, so that it is ready for export. Any selling commission incurred by the buyer with respect to the imported merchandise, constitutes part of the transaction value. Buying commission do not. A selling commission means any commission paid to the seller's agent, who is related to or controlled by, or works for or on behalf of, the manufacturer or seller. The apportioned value of any assist constitutes part of the transaction value of the imported merchandise. First the value of the assist is determined, then the value is prorated to the imported merchandise. So, what is an assist? An assist is any of the things that we're going to discuss, that the buyer of imported merchandise provides directly or indirectly, free of charge, or at a reduced cost, for use in the production or sale of the merchandise for export to the United States. They include 1. Materials, components, parts, and similar items incorporated in the imported merchandise. 2. Tools, dyes, molds, and similar items used in producing the imported merchandise. 3. Merchandise consumed in producing the imported merchandise. 4. Engineering, development, artwork, design work, and plans and sketches that are undertaken outside the United States. Engineering will be treated as an assist if the service or work is 1. Performed by a person domiciled within the United States. 2. Performed while that person is acting as an employee or agent of the buyer of the imported merchandise and 3. Incidental to other engineering, development, artwork, design work, or plans or sketches undertaken within the United States. What about the value of an assist and how do you determine it? In determining the value of an assist, the following rules apply. 1. The value is either a. The cost of acquiring the assist, if acquired by the importer from an unrelated seller, or b. The cost of the assist, if produced by the importer, or a person related to the importer. 2. The value includes the cost of transporting the assist to the place of production. 3. The value of assists used in producing the imported merchandise is adjusted, to reflect use, repairs, modifications, or other factors affecting the value of the assists. Assists of this type include such items as tools, dyes, and molds. For example, if the importer previously used the assist, regardless of whether he acquired or produced it, the original cost of acquisition or of production must be decreased to reflect the use. Alternatively, repairs and modifications may result in the value of the assist having to be adjusted upward. In case of engineering, development, artwork, design work, and plans and sketches undertaken elsewhere than in the United States, the value is the cost of obtaining copies of the assist if the assist is available in the public domain, the cost of the purpose or lease if the assist was bought or leased by the buyer from an unrelated person. The value added outside the United States, if the assist was reproduced in the United States and one or more foreign countries. So far as possible, the buyer's commercial record system will be used to determine the value of an assist, especially use assists as engineering, development, artwork, design work, and plans and sketches undertaken elsewhere in the United States. Now, let's move on to apportionment and explore what it means. Having determined the value of an assist, the next step is to prorate that value of the imported merchandise. The apportionment is done in a reasonable manner, appropriate to the circumstances, and in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. By the latter is meant any generally recognized consensus or substantial authoritative support regarding the recording and meaning of assets and liabilities and changes, the disclosing of information and the preparing of financial statements. 
royalty or license fees that a buyer must pay directly or indirectly as a condition of the sale of the imported merchandise for exportation to the United States will be included in the transaction value. Ultimately, whether a royalty or license fee is dutiable will depend on whether the buyer had to pay it as a condition of the sale and to whom and under what circumstances it was paid. The dutiability status will have to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Charges for the right to reproduce the imported goods in the United States are not dutiable. This right applies only to the following types of merchandise. Originals or copies of artistic or scientific works. Originals or copies of models and industrial drawings. Model machines and prototypes. Plant and animal species. Any proceeds resulting from the subsequent resale, disposal, or use of the imported merchandise that accrue, directly or indirectly, to the seller, are dutiable. These proceeds are added to the price actually paid, or payable, if not otherwise included. The price actually paid, or payable, for the imported merchandise is the total payment, excluding international freight, insurance and other CIF charges, that the buyer makes to the seller. This payment may be direct, or indirect. Some examples of an indirect payment are, when the buyer settles all, or part of a debt owed by the seller, or, when the seller reduces the price on a current importation, to settle a debt he owes the buyer. Such indirect payments are part of the transaction value. However, if a buyer performs an activity on his own account, other than those which may be included in the transaction value, then the activity is not considered an indirect payment to the seller, and is not part of the transaction value. This applies, even though the buyer's activity might be regarded as benefiting the seller, for example, advertising. The amount to be excluded from transaction value are as follows. The cost, charges, or expenses incurred for transportation, insurance, and related services, incident to the international shipment of the goods from the country of exportation to the place of importation in the United States. Any reasonable cost or charges incurred for Constructing, erecting, assembling, maintaining, or providing technical assistance with respect to the goods after importation into the United States or transporting the goods after importation. The customs duties and other federal taxes, including any federal excise tax, for which sellers in the United States are ordinarily liable. The transaction value of imported merchandise is the appraised value of that merchandise, provided certain limitations do not exist. If any of these limitations are present, then transaction value cannot be used as the appraised value, and the next basis of value will be considered. The limitations can be divided into four groups. 1. Restrictions on the disposition or use of the merchandise. 2. Conditions for which a value cannot be determined. 3. Proceeds of any subsequent resale, disposal, or use of the merchandise, accruing to the seller, for which an appropriate adjustment to transaction value cannot be made. 4. Related party transactions, where the transaction value is not acceptable. The term acceptable means that, the relationship between the buyer and seller did not influence the price actually paid, or payable. Examining the circumstances of the sale will help make this determination. Alternatively, acceptable can also mean that, the transaction value of the imported merchandise, closely approximates one of the following test values, provided these values relate to merchandise exported to the United States at or about the same time as the imported merchandise. The transaction value of identical merchandise, or of similar merchandise, in sales to unrelated buyers in the United States. The destructive value or computed value for identical merchandise or similar merchandise. The test values are used for comparison only they do not form a substitute basis of valuation. In determining whether the transaction value is close, one of the foregoing test values, an adjustment is made if the sales involved differ in commercial levels, quantity levels, the costs, commission, values, fees, and proceeds added to the transaction value, price paid, if not included in the price. The costs incurred by the seller in sales in which he and the buyer are not related, that are not incurred by the seller in sales in which he and the buyer are related. As stated, the test values are alternatives to the relationship criterion. If one of the test values is met, it is not necessary to examine the question of whether the relationship influenced the price. When the transaction value cannot be determined, 
then the customs value of the imported goods being appraised is the transaction value of identical merchandise. If merchandise identical to the imported goods cannot be found, or an acceptable transaction value for such merchandise does not exist, then, the customs value is the transaction of similar merchandise. The above value would be a previously accepted customs value. Besides the data common to all three transaction values, certain factors specifically apply to the transaction value of identical merchandise or similar merchandise. These factors concern, 1, the exportation date, 2, the level and quantity of sales, 3, the meaning, and, 4, the order of precedence of identical merchandise and of similar merchandise. So, let's go over these in that order, starting with the exportation date. The identical, similar, merchandise for which a value is being determined must have been exported to the United States at or about the same time that the merchandise being appraised is exported to the United States. Sales Level, Quantity The transaction value of identical, similar, merchandise must be based on sales of identical or similar merchandise at the same commercial level and in substantially the same quantity as the sale of the merchandise being appraised. If no such sale exists, then sales at either a different commercial level or in different quantities or both can be used but must be adjusted to take account of any such difference. Any adjustment must be based on sufficient information, that is, information establishing the reasonableness and accuracy of the adjustment. Meanings The term, identical merchandise, means merchandise that is identical in all respects to the merchandise being appraised. Produced in the same country as the merchandise being appraised. Produced by the same person as the merchandise being appraised. If merchandise meeting all three criteria cannot be found, then identical merchandise is merchandise satisfying the first two criteria, but produced by a different person than the producer of merchandise being appraised. Merchandise can be identical to the merchandise being appraised and still show minor differences in appearance. Identical merchandise does not include merchandise that incorporates or reflects engineering, development, artwork, design work, and plans and sketches, provided free or at reduced cost to the buyer and undertaken in the United States. The term similar merchandise means merchandise that is produced in the same country and by the same person as the merchandise being appraised. Like the merchandise being appraised in characteristics and component materials commercially interchangeable with the merchandise being appraised. If merchandise meeting the foregoing criteria cannot be found, then similar merchandise is merchandise having the same country of production, like characteristics and component materials and commercial interchangeability, but produced by a different person. In determining whether goods are similar, some of the factors to be considered are the quality of the goods, their reputation, and existence of a trademark. Similar merchandise does not include merchandise that incorporates or reflects engineering, development, artwork, design work, and plans and sketches provided free or at reduced cost to the buyer and undertaken in the United States. Order of precedence. It is possible that two or more transaction values for identical or similar merchandise will be determined. In such a case, the lowest value will be used as the appraised value of the imported merchandise. Now, we're going to talk about other bases, which are used in calculating the value of the merchandise. Those bases are deductive and computed value. Let's begin with deductive value. If the transaction value of imported merchandise, of identical merchandise, or of similar merchandise cannot be determined, then deductive value is calculated for the merchandise being appraised. Deductive value is the next basis of appraisement at the time of the entry summary is filed to be used unless the importer designates computed value as the preferred method of appraisement. We'll talk about computed value in a moment. If computed value was chosen and subsequently determined not to exist for customs valuation purposes, then the basis of appraisement reverts to deductive value. If an assist is involved in a sale, that sale cannot be used in determining deductive value. So, any sale to a person, who supplies an assist for use in connection with the production or sale for export of the merchandise concerned is disregarded for purposes of determining deductive value. Basically, deductive value is the resale price in the United States after importation of the goods with deductions for certain items. In discussing deductive value, the term merchandise concerned is used. 
The term means the merchandise being appraised, identical merchandise, or similar merchandise. Generally, the deductive value is calculated by starting with a unit price and making certain additions to and deductions from that price. Unit price. One of three prices constitutes the unit price in deductive value. The price used depends on when and in what condition the merchandise concerned is sold in the United States. 1. Time and condition. The merchandise is sold in the condition as imported, at or about the date of importation of the merchandise being appraised. Price. The price used is the unit price at which the greatest aggregate quantity of the merchandise concerned is sold at or about the date of importation. 2. Time and condition. The merchandise concerned is sold in the condition as imported, but not sold at, or about the date of importation of the merchandise being appraised. Price. The price used is the unit price at which the greatest aggregate quantity of the merchandise concerned is sold, after the date of importation of the merchandise being appraised, but before the close of the 90th day after the date of importation. 3. Time and condition. The merchandise concerned is not sold in the condition as imported, and not sold before the close of the 90th day after the date of importation of the merchandise being appraised. Price. The price used is the unit price at which the greatest aggregate quantity of the merchandise being appraised, after further processing, is sold before the 180th day after the date of importation. The third price is also known as the further processing price or super deductive. Additions. Packing costs for the merchandise concerned are added to the price used for deductive value, provided these costs have not otherwise been included. These costs are added regardless of whether the importer or the buyer incurs the costs. Packing costs means the cost of all containers and coverings of whatever nature and packing, whether for labor or materials, used in placing the merchandise in condition, packed ready for shipment to the United States. Deductions Certain items are not part of the deductive value and must be deducted from the unit price. These items are as follows. Commissions or profit and general expenses. Any commission usually paid or agreed to be paid or the addition usually made for profit and general expenses applicable to sales in the United States of imported merchandise that is of the same class or kind as the merchandise concerned, regardless of the country of exportation. Transportation insurance costs. The usual and associated costs of transporting and ensuring the merchandise concerned from a. the country of exportation to the place of importation in the United States and b. the place of importation to the place of delivery in the United States, provided these costs are not included as a general expense under the preceding item. Customs duties, federal taxes. The customs duties and other federal taxes payable on the merchandise concerned because of its importance plus any federal excise tax on or measured by the value of such merchandise for which sellers in the United States are ordinarily liable. Value of further processing. The value added by processing the merchandise after importation, provided that sufficient information exists concerning the costs of processing. The price determined for deductive value is reduced by the value of further processing only if the third unit price, the super deductive, is used as deductive value. Super deductive. The importer has the option to ask that deductive value be based on the further processing price. If the importer makes the choice, certain facts concerning valuing the further processing method, termed super deductive, must be followed. Under the super deductive method, the merchandise concerned is not sold in the condition as imported, and not sold before the close of the 90th day after the date of importation, but is sold before the 180th day after the date of importation. Under this method, an amount equal to the value of the further processing must be deducted from the unit price in determining deductive value. The amount so deducted must be based on objective and quantifiable data concerning the cost of such work, as well as any spoilage, waste, or scrap derived from that work. Items such as accepted industry formulas, methods of construction, and industry practices could be used as a basis for calculating the amount to be deducted. Generally, the super deductive method cannot be used if the further processing destroys the identity of the goods. Such situation will be decided on a case-by-case -case basis for the following reasons. 1. Sometimes, even though the identity of the goods is lost, 
the value added by the processing can be determined accurately, without unreasonable difficulty for importers or for the customs service. Two, in some cases, the imported goods still keep their identity after processing, but form only a minor part of the goods sold in the United States. In such cases, using the super deductive method to value, the imported goods will not be justified. The super deductive method cannot be used if the merchandise concerned is sold in the condition as imported before the close of the 90th day after the date of importation of the merchandise being appraised. Now, let's talk about the computed value. The next basis of appraisement is computed value. If customs valuation cannot be based on any of the values previously discussed, then computed value is considered. This value is also the one the importer can select to precede deductive value as a basis of appraisement. Computed value consists of the sum of the following items. 1. Materials, fabrication, and other processing used in producing the imported merchandise. 2. Profit and general expenses. 3. Any assist if not included above. And 4. Packing costs. Let's look at materials, fabrication, and other processing. The cost or value of the materials, fabrication, and other processing of any kind used in producing the imported merchandise is based on a. information provided by or on behalf of the producer and b. the commercial accounts of the producer if the accounts are consistent with generally accepted accounting principles applied in the country of production of the goods. If the country of exportation imposes an internal tax on the materials, or their disposition and refunds the tax when merchandise produced from the materials is exported, then the amount of the internal tax is not included as part of the cost or value of the materials. Let's look at profit and general expenses. The producer's profit and general expenses are used, provided they are consistent with the usual profit and general expenses reflected by producers in the country of exportation in sales of merchandise of the same class or kind as the imported merchandise. Some facts concerning the amount for profit and general expenses should be mentioned. The amount is determined by information supplied by the producer and is based on his or her commercial accounts, provided such accounts are consistent with generally accepted accounting principles in the country of production. As a point of contrast, for deductive value, the generally accepted accounting principles used are those in the United States, whereas in computed value, the generally accepted accounting principles are those in the country of production. The producer's profit and general expenses must be consistent with those usually reflected in sales of goods of the same class or kind as the imported merchandise that are made by producers in the country of exportation for export to the United States. If they are not consistent, then the amount for profit and general expenses is based on the usual profit and general expenses of such producers. The amount for profit and general expenses is taken as a whole. This is the same treatment as occurs in deductive value. Basically, a producer's profit could be low and his or her general expenses high, so that the total amount is consistent with that usually reflected in sales of goods of the same class or kind. In such a situation, a producer's actual profit figures, even if low, will be used, provided he or she has valid commercial reasons to justify them and the pricing policy reflects usual pricing policies in the industry concerned. If the value of an assist used in producing the merchandise is not included as part of the producer's materials, fabrication, other processing, or general expenses, then the prorated value of the assist will be included in computed value. It is important that the value of the assist not to be included elsewhere, because no component of computed value should be counted more than once in determining computed value. The value of any engineering, development, artwork, design work, and plans and sketches undertaken in the United States is included in computed value only to the extent that such value has been charged to the producer. The cost of all containers and coverings of whatever nature and of packing, whether for labor or material, used in placing merchandise in condition and packed ready for shipment to the United States is included in computed value. Under computed value, merchandise of the same class or kind, must be imported from the same country as the merchandise appraised and must be within a group or range of goods produced by a particular industry or industry sector. Whether certain merchandise is of the same class or kind as other merchandise will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. 
In determining usual profit and general expenses, sales for export to the United States of the narrowest group or range of merchandise, that includes the merchandise being appraised, will be examined, providing that the necessary information can be obtained. As a point of contrast, under deductive value, merchandise of the same class or kind includes merchandise imported from other countries, besides the country from which the merchandise being appraised was imported. Under computed value, merchandise of the same class or kind is limited to merchandise imported from the same country as the merchandise being appraised. What happens when other values cannot be determined? If none of the previous five values can be used to appraise the imported merchandise, then, the customs value must be based on a value, derived from one of the five previous methods, reasonably adjusted as necessary. The value so determined should be based, to the greatest extent possible, on previously determined values. In order for customs to consider an importer's argument regarding appraisement, the information upon which the argument is based, must be made available to customs, whether it was generated by a foreign or domestic source. Some examples of how the other methods can be reasonably adjusted are for identical merchandise or similar merchandise. 1. The requirement that the identical merchandise or similar merchandise should be exported at or about the same time as the merchandise being appraised could be flexibly interpreted. 2. Identical imported merchandise or similar merchandise produced in a country, other than the country of exportation of the merchandise being appraised, could be the basis for customs valuation. 3. Customs value of identical imported merchandise, or similar merchandise, already determined on the basis of deductive value and computed value, could be used. For the deductive method, the 90-day requirement may be administered flexibly. Now, let's talk briefly here on the rules of origin. The origin of merchandise that is imported into the customs territory of the United States can affect the rate of duty, entitlement for special programs, admissibility, quota, anti-dumping, or countervailing duties, procurement by government agencies, and marking requirements. In order to determine a product's country of origin, the importer should consult the applicable rules of origin. There are two basic types of rules of origin, non-preferential and preferential. Non-preferential rules generally apply in the absence of bilateral or multilateral trade agreements. Preferential rules are applied to merchandise to determine its eligibility for special treatment under various trade agreements or special legislation, such as the Generalized System of Preferences, the North American Free Trade Agreement, or the African Growth and Opportunity Act. There are also rules of origin for textile and apparel articles, these are provided for by statutes.